Well, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. We are in our third week of Advent, and we are so glad to have you here with us today. And um, there's a lot going on, right? There's a lot going on this Christmas. There's always a lot going on. And I think sometimes, with all the busyness and the holiday specials on TV and all the music and just all the different visuals that we see throughout the season, I think that Christmas can be confusing sometimes. I mean, what do you think? I, especially to kids, right? To kids, because I think Christmas, it gets celebrated in so many different ways by so many different people that I think it's easy for maybe some of those things to accidentally overlap and it could cause a little confusion. I found a very humorous list <laughs> about some of that confusion and it says, uh, you might be confused at Christmas if. <laughs> if your child looks at the nativity scene nestled serenely beneath your tree and says, what's the camel doing in Santa's workshop? You might be confused at Christmas. If your child is writing a letter to baby Jesus at the North Pole asking for a pony like the one Mary rode in the Christmas parade, you might be confused at Christmas. If you sing Amazing Grace to the tune of Frosty the Snowman, you might be confused at Christmas. If your preschooler adds a little green Play-Doh figure to the nativity scene and reminds you that you forgot the Grinch, you might be confused at Christmas. If your plastic caravan of wise men that are on your roof has a lead camel with a 200 watt nose, you might be confused at Christmas. It's always around this time that we see Christians arguing for Christ in Christmas, right? But we have to acknowledge that different people celebrate Christmas different ways. In fact, it's not even until the 19th century that Americans begin to celebrate Christmas. Americans reinvented Christmas. We changed it from the raucous, carnival, drunken winter holiday into a family-centered, peace-on-earth, goodwill-towards-men holiday. In 1819, best-selling author Washington Irving, he wrote The Sketchbook of Jeffrey. It was a series of short stories about the celebration of Christmas in a English manor house. The sketches feature a squire who invited the poor into his estate for the holiday. And in real life, those two classes were in conflict. But in Washington Irving's book, they mingled effortlessly. Because in Irving's mind, Christmas should be peaceful. It should be a warm-hearted holiday that brings groups of people together regardless of wealth and regardless of social class. Irving's fictitious characters enjoyed what he called ancient customs. But Irving's stories were not based on any holiday celebration that he had ever attended. In fact, many historians say that Irving actually invented Christmas tradition by implying that his stories were about true customs. Three years later, in 1822, Twas the Night Before Christmas was written. 26 years after that, in 1848, Prince Albert had his Christmas tree depicted in the newspaper. And then 83 years after that, in 1931, Coca-Cola created the very iconic picture that we all recognize as Santa Claus. The American Santa Claus is less than 100 years old. Christmas trees are 174 years old. In fact, all of American Christmas is barely 200 years old. And look where we are today. The American Christmas is a time of fun and frenzy and excitement and exhaustion. <laughs> it is not spiritual, it's secular. In fact, it's pretty unique. Our food, our traditions, our decorations, they're pretty much our own. The American Christmas isn't celebrated 
like how we do anywhere else in the world. And that's because our traditions are borrowed from all over the world. We already mentioned that Christmas trees came from England. Hanging stockings by the fireplace comes from Scandinavia. Kissing under the mistletoe comes from Greece. Candy canes and gingerbread houses are from Germany. And wrapping gifts is from ancient China. The American Christmas is unlike anything else in the world. It's chestnuts roasting over an open fire. It's mistletoe and holly. It's stockings being hung by the chimney with care. It's eggnog and fruitcake. Oh yeah, fruitcake? That's from India. It's Bing Crosby singing, I'm dreaming of a white Christmas in the movie White Christmas. <laughs> and there's another side of the American Christmas, the economy. Last week we talked about how there's a sense of more, more, more at Christmas, right? Everybody buys gifts for everyone and our shopping list gets longer and longer. In fact, our national economy, to some extent, is measured by how well we do at Christmas. And don't get me wrong, I love the American Christmas. I do. And I don't believe there's anything wrong with celebrating these traditions or any other traditions. You should have fun. You should have a great time. Enjoy those family gatherings. Delight in the excitement of children and their anticipation. Sing songs like Jingle Bells. Sing Frosty the Snowman. God is not against cultural expression. He is not against custom. But if you pull aside the tinsel, if you look under the tree, I think most of us see a second layer to Christmas. And again, you don't have to be a Christian to see it. Most Christmas movies and many Christmas songs will tell you there is a spirit of giving at Christmas. One of the wonderful things about the season is the way that it changes people. Whether people approach the holiday as secular or spiritual, there is a spirit of giving that characterizes the season. During this season, there is a spirit of goodwill and cheer. Charles Dickens, A Christmas Carol, was written in 1843. That's a few years before Prince Albert's Christmas tree. And in that story, it certainly seems to be a fable about welfare and about the poor and about giving and about being generous. So much so that the word Scrooge is now associated with being stingy. This is why you will also see red buckets and hear the bell ringers outside of stores because at Christmas time, people are more likely to think of others, especially people who are less fortunate than they. Hundreds and thousands and perhaps millions of dollars are given during the month of December, and it's a beautiful thing. And perhaps it's that, the spirit of giving that we talk about when we say that we wish Christmas would be carried the whole year through. Well, underneath that spirit, there is another layer to Christmas, and that's the nativity, right? Most specifically, this picture, this image, this sacredness. We call it the reason for the season. We call it Christ in Christmas. It's the nativity, it's the creche, it's the pageantry, it's the truth of Christmas. And it's all of it, the whole picture, the Virgin Mary, Joseph, the manger, the stable, the animals, the angels, the shepherds, the north star, and the three wise men. Luke 2 says, in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who is with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. 
And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and laying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds had told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as had been told them. Later, there was a North Star and the wise men used it to find their way to Joseph and Mary at Jesus and, and Jesus at their house in Bethlehem. And Matthew gives that account in his chapter. The birth of Jesus is one of the greatest events of all time, perhaps only second to Easter, the story of his death, the story of his resurrection. Because it's in the birth of Jesus that God does this extraordinary thing. He becomes human. He becomes one of us. And he is one of us, but yet without sin. And the Old Testament said that he was coming. And for centuries, the world waited. And then finally, God came. And when he did, it was as a baby to a poor family in this obscure village in occupied territory. And it's from these humble beginnings that Jesus later turns the world upside down. And perhaps there are a few Christians who feel Christmas should be about Jesus and nothing else. That there is only one right way to celebrate. But I would remind them, for the first 300 years of Christianity, we did not celebrate Jesus' birth. In fact, we don't know the month or the year that he was born, right? We all know that he wasn't born on December 25th, right? In truth, the pagans did not steal Christmas from us. We stole it from them. December 25th is the date of a major Roman festival to the sun god, and the Christian leaders really wanted to Christianize that pagan holiday. Ironically, years later, in 1871, a very famous preacher named Charles Spurgeon said, we certainly, we do not believe in the present ecclesiastical arrangement called Christmas. First, because we do not believe in the mass at all. And secondly, because we find no scriptural warrant, whatever, for observing any day as the birthday of the Savior. And he's not wrong. We see early Christians in the Bible remembering Jesus' death, his resurrection, but not his birth. Now, does that mean it's wrong? Of course not. Like I said, Christmas should be celebrated, and it is celebrated in so many different ways. The American Christmas is celebrated with trees and Santa Claus, and it's fun. The giving of Christmas presents reminds us of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, but also the warmth and compassion of giving to our fellow man. And the Christ in Christmas stresses the importance of spirituality and, of course, the ultimate gift of God. So we sing. We sing joy to the world. The Lord has come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing. We as Christians understand for as much as Easter is a time to remember that Jesus gave his life, Christmas is the time to remember that God gave his son. So it's that spirit of giving that I want to close with. And I want to make an argument for in our spiritual life. 
giving can be just as much a part of our spiritual life as any other aspect in the holiday. Verse seven says, Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. And then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Very little is known about the wise men, but we do know that they gave, right? They gave. And we can look at what they gave and how they gave and evaluate perhaps how we give. And the first thing I would notice is that they gave sacrificially, right? They gave sacrificially. The wise men gave sacrificially. We, we do know that they would have left everything and traveled far to visit Jesus. They could have come from as far as Iraq, and that means they could have traveled up to 300 miles and initially probably had no idea where they were going. Now, true, they bring gifts that have monetary value, but the bigger gift was their time. The bigger gift was their sacrifice. We give gifts at Christmas, partially out of remembrance for this moment. And you will most certainly give a gift this year. So what's inside the box? Is it just something that you bought with money? Is it gold? Or is there any heart and soul underneath the wrapping paper? Is there any sacrifice? Is there a sacrifice of your time? A sacrifice of the effort that was needed to give it? A sacrifice of the effort in making it? That gift, is it a part of you? And if so, what does that look like? Men, what would happen if your wife opened a huge package from you, but inside there was only a tiny piece of paper that said, honey, I love you so much. I'm going to do all the laundry next month. Washed and folded and put away. Women, what if your husband opened up his package and you wrote a letter to him telling him a telling him how much he really means to you and why you're so glad that he is your husband and why you're so proud of the things that he has accomplished with your family. What about promising to wash your son's car every month? Doesn't that sound better than a can opener? Doesn't that sound better than a tie? Christmas is a time of giving. And for as much as we make it about the baby, that baby grew up to be a man. And that baby gave his life on the cross, that was the, which is the greatest sacrifice ever. Jesus says, greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. What can you give that requires you to put some heart and soul into it? What can you give that represents sacrifice this year? Secondly, we see that they give personally. The wise men, they give personally. They gave sacrificially, they gave personally. Don't they? I mean, they make the trip themselves. Isn't that crazy? We, we sing the song, We Three Kings, right? And our little statues that we have of them in the house, they have, they have little crowns, but can you imagine if they really were kings and that they made this trip themselves? Did, they didn't send an emissary. <laughs> they didn't send a servant. It wasn't delivered by Amazon or FedEx. They delivered it personally. The gift came personally from the giver. For whatever reason, they felt it was necessary that they show up and give the gift personally. That's, that's what a gift of grace is. A gift that's given personally. A gift that includes self. 
a, a gift of grace that comes with a person. A personal gift is a gift of togetherness, a, a, a gift that values relationships, a, a gift that displays love. That's something you can't put in the mail. What can you give this year that's personal? How can you give of yourself? How can you spend some time with someone as a gift? If there's a single man or a single woman that lives in your neighborhood, I bet they would just love to spend even a few hours with your family this Christmas. Oh, the power of what a gift of personal presence can be for some people. Husbands, what if your wife opens a package and there's a note that says, Honey, because I love you so much and I want to give myself to you, I promise to set aside one whole day every month in the coming year and we will do whatever you want to do together. Twelve days next year just for us. Wives, what if your husband opens a package that says, Honey, because I love you so much, I want to wake up every Monday morning, fix you breakfast and coffee, and I want to pray out loud for you about the activities you have in the coming week so that every week it starts off bathed, you hearing me pray for you. Parents, how about giving the gift to your children one Saturday a month where you say, we will do whatever you want to do. You pick the activity for the entire family and we will all do it together. Or visiting someone that you know who's in a nursing home, promising to spend an hour with them once a month, all next year. Spending time with someone is a personal gift of grace. How can you give of yourself by spending a little time with someone. This Christmas, I decided to make the theme here at Walden Church, Joy to the World, because of the lyric uh, in the song, Let Every Heart Prepare Him Room. Because I felt that was two things we all needed. First, to make sure that Christmas was a time of preparedness, where we were creating space in our lives for God. But second, for joy. So I think we should give joyously. We should. We should give joyously. I need more joy in my life. I want more joy in my life. The world out there does not feel joyful. <laughs> and when Christmas is over, I miss the joy. Verse 10 says, when they saw the star, the wise men were overjoyed. They were overjoyed just seeing the star. They were thrilled because they knew they were that much closer to being with the baby Jesus. They were overwhelmed to be able to find the child and to offer them their gifts because giving brings the giver joy. Giving brings the giver joy. Because what do we say when we find that perfect gift? What do we always say? I can't wait to see the look on their face, right? Notice. Giving a gift brings joy to the giver and the receiver. How can you turn giving into joy-filled giving this year? Because I'll be the first to admit it. I have six brothers and sisters, in-laws, two sons, a wife, a mother-in-law, and two parents to buy for at Christmas. I am probably gonna buy a lot of very boring presents. <laughs> <laughs> Merry Christmas, here's a blender, right? When was the last time you gave a blender to someone that caused them, or you, to be overjoyed? <laughs> Doesn't happen. But when was the last time you gave a gift that made the receiver cry? When was the last time you were able to give a gift that brought a tear to your own eye? Those kind of gifts, they take some thinking. They take some sacrifice. But isn't that what Christmas gift giving should be about? I, Scrooge does not walk into the Cratchit home with a blender, right? But in fact, in the original story, 
Scrooge doesn't visit the Cratchit home at all. Do you remember where he went first? He went to his nephew's home. He went to his only family. And he asked them for forgiveness. The first gift he gave was not the gift of himself or the gift of sacrifice. The very first gift he gave was the gift of joy. The joy he gave Fred and Lily to finally accept an invitation to share a meal, to share an evening, because it was the gift that he had been denying them his entire life. In remembering the gift of Jesus, in remembering the gifts of the wise men, let's remember why the gifts are given in the first place. Let's not allow gift giving to become routine or tradition, so much so that it loses meaning, and then certainly loses joy. What can you give that would cause you to be filled with joy? What can you give that would cause the receiver to bring a tear to the eye? Give joyously, joy to the world. The Lord has come, let earth receive her king, let every heart prepare him room, and heaven and nature sing. What a beautiful worship song. We should give worshipfully. Matthew 2.11 says, On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. They opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and incense and myrrh. The wise men gave worshipfully. They bowed down and worshiped Christ the Lord. And that's the real reason why they came in person. That's why they made this long trip, was so that they could worship. I mean, isn't this another aspect of why we give? Because of what Christ has given us? Christ has given grace to us, forgiveness to us, so we worship. So how can you give worshipfully this year? That's a tough one, right? I'd have to think about that. Well, here's a question. Do you pray? Do you pray about what you will give? Do you pray about the gift that you would give? Or do we just jump in the car and, you know, drive to the mall and wander around? Do we pray intentionally about what we would give? Or do we just click add to cart? Men, do you ask God how you could give a part of God's grace to your wife? Women, do you ask God how to share his grace with your husband? Parents, do you ask God how you could give grace to your children? Do you ask God how you could share grace with lonely people or relatives or non-believers or co-workers? Are we giving out of obligation? Or are you giving because God has laid it on your heart to give? Are you just giving because you're expected to give? Are you giving unexpected gifts? Let's bring worship back to giving. Give prayerfully. Give out a sense of thankfulness for what God has done for you. Give worshipfully. 2 Corinthians 9 says, by their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others, while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you, thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. I don't let the secular aspects of Christmas bother me. I don't see anything wrong with Santa or Christmas trees or eggnog. Eggnog is actually from England. 
<laughs> there are secular aspects to Christmas and spiritual aspects to Christmas. And for as much as they seem different, the thing that connects them is giving. It's easy for us to get caught up in all the different things that Christmas has become, that we actually miss why it started all those years ago. God gave. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Joy to the world the Lord has given. Amen? So in a way, I do agree with all the cheesy Hallmark movies, but maybe not exactly for the same reason. I hope we Christians live lives characterized by giving all the year long, but not because of some holiday emotion, but because of the commands of God and because we want to be like God, who is the giver of every good thing. Let me remind you something else about giving. Some of the most important gifts don't have anything to do with money. There is a gift of praise. There is a gift of encouragement. Give it liberally. There is a gift of consideration. Be generous with it. There is a gift of concession. To say, let's do it your way. Let's do what you want to do. And I'm sorry. Give it regularly. There is a gift of gratitude. We can never express too much thanksgiving. There is a gift of attention. People really need it. They need our personal presence. They need our time. There is a gift of confidence. Plant seeds of courage and hope and capability in others. There is a gift, of course, that is the greatest gift of all, and that is the gift of salvation. Share the grace and love of Jesus with everyone. I encourage you to participate in the giving of Christmas. Love the people that God has put in your life and shower them with all kinds of gifts, both at Christmas time and all the year through. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for Christmas and for everything that it brings. We thank you for each twinkling star, each ornament that hangs on the tree, stockings hung by the fire with care, and for the baby laying in a manger. Lord, all of it, all of it wrapped together in a spirit of giving, whether it's secular or spiritual, this is the time where we think of others. Isn't that what you've called us to do? Isn't that who you've asked us to be? People who would consider our fellow man, people who would consider our neighbor and loving them as ourselves, people who would forgive even an enemy. Lord, when we say that we wish it was Christmas every day of the year, we are wishing that we would feel this sense of gratitude every day, that we would pursue peace on earth every day, that we would be content and that we would be givers, that we would give sacrificially, that we would give personally, that we would give joyfully, and that we would give worshipfully. The way your son gave, the way you give. May the gifts that are given this Christmas be gifts that reflect the heart of God. And ultimately, we pray for the gift of salvation so that every knee bends and every tongue confesses that Jesus is King. Amen. Thank you so much for hanging out with us this Sunday and sharing another Christmas message with Walden Community Church. We want to remind you, though, 
that every church across America has an empty seat for you. There is always a place for you. You are welcome, not just now at December, but all the year through. Please seek out and find your local church. Plug in, be a part of it. You don't miss the sermon and you don't miss the worship. You miss the fellowship. You miss the people. And that is what we miss the most. Whether we've moved from one town to another or it's just been a while since we've been there, I would invite you to return. Find your local church, plug in and serve. Shake hands with strangers until they are no longer strangers. You have brothers and sisters waiting to welcome you and love you and they want to give you fellowship and grace. You and yours have a blessed and Merry Christmas. I love you guys. I'll see you soon.